last video, I want to share with you probably one of my favorite things to do, and that is fishing small mountain streams. And we call this blue lining. There's a number of terms for it, but you know, we have so many great limestone streams and rivers in the state of Pennsylvania, and also a lot of larger bodies of water that harbor bass, muskie, and other fish species. But when you go onto a topo map, and if you look at a lot of these small blue lines, these smaller streams that feed into these larger bodies of water, these streams are going to harbor a great population of both wild and native fish. And what I want to do is I just want to share with you a, a few tips about getting into these smaller stream situations. First and foremost is when you take a look around, we have tight canopy. Small stream situations really require focus. And I would say probably some of my biggest frustrations have occurred on small mountain streams just because of getting the fly stuck on my surroundings. But also some of my some of my most enjoyable experiences have also occurred on small streams, so it's kind of like all good things in life. But when you're talking about your general approach, what we're trying to do is develop what I call situational awareness. Just having a good round view of your world, meaning where I can move the rod tip so I can make a cast stroke without getting stuck in the trees. And this is one situation where I will wear glasses, but because we're in usually pretty, th uh, pretty tight sections of cover and thickets, as my mentor Joe Humphreys talks about, I'm not worried about as much glare coming down and hitting the water, so I'm not going to be wearing a brimmed hat. The problem with a brim hat is it really reduces your peripheral vision above you. And when you're working in such tight quarters like this, I want to be able to be able to make my cast stroke, but I want to be able to look at, have my eyes scan above and around me when I'm making that cast stroke really tell me where I can move this rod tip without worrying about smacking the rod tip off a branch. And the one thing about brimmed hats, it's going to really reduce a lot of your visibility in this quadrant. So for that fact, this is why when I'm fishing small streams, I will not wear traditional hats. If it's cold, I'll wear a knitted hat, but usually I'm just wearing a pair of sunglasses, but allowing myself to kind of scan this overall area. The other part of this game is talking about loop control. and going back to that principle of that short little cast stroke, but also the rod tip travel path, meaning that the shape of the line, the loop that's coming off the rod tip, what we're trying to do is we're trying to go under and around obstacles. We're trying to throw a tight little wedge. And the shape of the line really determines by the path of the rod tip. If the rod tip moves in this wide arc, the loop's going to open up and we're going to be hanging our flies above us everywhere on the stream. So instead of what we're trying to do is we're trying to throw a nice little narrow path. And the straighter the path for the rod tip, the narrower the loop, and the more likely we're able to go under obstacles and obstructions. And just remember the rod hand right here, whether you're using the thumb on top or the finger on top, that path, if my hand, if you're using the thumb on top, that my thumb pad travels in a fairly straight line. It's not an exactly straight path. There's a little bit of a wrist motion to turn that rod tip over. But if my thumb travels in a relatively straight line, I'm going to throw a, a nice loop. What we call pain in the igloo, if my wrist is breaking way too much and it's opening up, I'm going to be in everything but the water. So when you're making this cast, it's that concept that Joe Humphrey shared with me and I shared with you at Rec Hall, is that you have a two-sided hammer. And what we're doing is we're putting a picture in front of us on the wall and we're putting the picture behind us on the wall. But the hammer is going to drift and it's going to tap out. We're tapping the nail to the wall. We're not hammering the floor, we're taking the, the hammer, you're going to tap the nail out and come back. Short path. And when I make the short cast and stroke here, right there, short little stroke, I can make a nice tight loop. It allows me to go under that op op obstacle right there and get some distance in tight brush. Right there, short little strokes. But remembering, I'm not breaking my wrist. The moment I break my wrist right here, I'm going to be stuck in a tree just like that. So just remember, short, compact movements in a fairly straight line. The other thing is, thinking about the length of the rod tip, we are in tight cover, we're in the small stream situation, but the one point I want all of you to remember is don't let anyone tell you you can't fish longer rods in tight brush. This, again, going back, I've learned so much from Joe, but what I've learned most about fishing from Joe is rod tip control and tight brush. 
So one of the things you can think about is just think about like a ceiling. When I look at a stream and I think about how long of a rod I can get away with, I look at the area and the ceiling can, is not always going to be vertical. Maybe the ceiling height is going to be more horizontal, but the whole idea is I look at the direction I can move the rod to, to make the cast stroke without actually getting stuck or ba basically banging my head off the ceiling. In this stream right here, yes, we have some tight brush five, six feet off the water, but if I go off in a horizontal plane, I have about 14, 15 feet. So in streams like this, fairly tight cover, but this is a stream where I'm using a nine foot rod and I feel like there is always gonna be some plane I can move that rod to, to make that cast stroke. One of the things that we talked about in class, that's using a roll cast. Maybe our back door is closed and this is where we need to make a cast forward, bring the rod tip up, let the line fold behind you. Once that line hangs behind you, then you can make a casting stroke. That's a good setup. But one of the things I want to share with you is a way to kind of help build up some momentum. And think about like you're trying to break down the door. You can get a, you can walk right up to the door. Some of you may be strong enough where you can just walk up to the door and just break it down, push it through. Or like me, you need to get like a running start. And when you watch Joe, if you ever watch Joe fish small streams, what he's going to do with his small stream roll cast Instead of just bringing the rod tip back like this, letting that line form, you're gonna see him wiggle his rod tip right here. Wiggling this line right here. And what that is doing here is actually energizing the line. It's doing a couple things. You're breaking water tension, but two, he's actually energizing the line right here to make us cast. And the thing you need to remember is the more energy I can create here, I can redirect the forward casting stroke. So what this does, this little wiggle approach here, basically creates a little bit of a running start to build momentum for your roll cast in tight cover. Now I'm making a cast here that's about 35 feet. There's about 40 feet. I can go here, wiggle, wiggle, shoot. Now that is going to allow you to really get distance in smaller streams by just developing that little bit of a head start, that little wiggle, 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 let the loop form and then make your cast stroke. Then you can get some distance in really tight cover. Any of my dry droppers, indicator flies, like this little micro chub, we're just gonna drop into a pre-treatment. Let it soak. Usually it's better the night before and then let it dry, but the stuff does dry fairly fast. But this is gonna be our indicator fly. There's a chance we can get a fish on this fly as well. And that's why I'm using a dry fly rather than a traditional indicator on these small streams, even though these fish are showing absolutely no signs of looking up there's still a chance and if i believe there's a chance to catch a fish on the dry fly i'm going to use an indicator fly over a traditional style indicator okay we have our tippet we're going to do a clinch knot right here in our hands about a seven or eight turn clinch create that loop get our drag fly put it in the bend seal it now we're going to take a nymph and we just drop a short distance here and on a larger Higgins SOS with a heavier tungsten bead. Short distance off my drive fly. But you don't always have to go super deep with these small streams, but we do have to go down. The same principles as before. Short length of line outside the rod tip. We can get fairly close to these fish because of the high water. We're just gonna high stick this indicator fly. This fluorescent yellow. There was a fish, short little strokes, pop it in there. And here's the deal, deeper water, shorter section between my dry fly and my nymph. Anytime my dry fly even hesitates, I'm gonna set the hook because it's such a high likely chance that it's a fish and not bottom, just because of how shallow I'm drifting my flies. Short little strokes. These smaller streams, these fish are pretty vicious. They're on the bite pretty fast. Like I missed right there. I, I gotta, I gotta get back in the game here. Making this cast, drift, drift, drift. Any hesitation, just a quick little slide downstream. Again, I'm gonna reach out here. Just watch that indicator fly, drift. 
moving up. Again, soft water coming in, but hot between us and these faster currents here. We're gonna make a cast and reach. This is why we're using a longer rod in these small streams. Reach, reach, reach. Kind of lift the rod, wasn't sure what that was. There we go. A little quicker this time. A little wild brown trout. Yeah, this is why I don't use a net on small streams like this. I feel like I can get these fish back in the water so much quicker without a net. But there we are, fairly sh deeper water there, maybe about two and a half feet deep, but a really shallow rig. Just notice we got some tree branches above us here. I'm gonna pitch this cast in here. I'm not gonna use the rod tip to lead the flies because super tight cover here. So we're just going to bow and arrow cast here. Line hand, line hand. There we are. Tight brush, watch for the rod tip. There we go. This is what I like about small streams. It's just excellent physical conditioning. Unlike a lot of the limestoners where you can kind of pick a small area, small grid and kind of really work it thoroughly for a couple hours. These smaller streams, you're just finding a couple spots, making a couple casts, and then just moving and finding the more pr productive water. So often you might cover miles of water and only fish a handful of spots. So again, it's fun to kind of get out, explore, stretch your legs. And this small stream fishing is one of those things that you can do to get that job done. Always try to get yourself in the best possible casting position right here. What I'm trying to do here is just gonna cast across my body, but before I do that, I'm just going to get on the other side. Just take a few extra moments to get in the best casting position right here. In this situation, I'm far more comfortable casting off my left shoulder than I was standing on the left side casting off my right. This gives me a better casting plane to kind of cast in line with the current. Same thing, a little flip upstream, working straight up. Nice placement, there's a fish. Yeehaw. The other strategy to think about, especially not just on small streams, but on larger bodies of water, when you have really cold water temps or maybe you had a really cold night the night before, is when you're going around just looking on a map but just strategically trying to locate areas where the sun is going to be in these spots or hitting the water earlier and longer and the the more sunlight or the quicker the sunlight is on the water often the better the fishing is going to be and it's amazing just when you're walking up and down a small stream like this how some sections are going to be completely dead it might be for the fact that sun hasn't gone on that water and it hasn't warmed up the water whatsoever when you go up around the bank, you hit some sun patch water, those fish are gonna be on the move. So just something to think about. It's not always the case, but sometimes it is the difference. Early season, especially on these small mountain streams. Keeping, we have this current, little back hit he's coming off to the side here on the left. It's just gonna be important that when I make this cast, I'm trying to find the current that's gonna keep the fly in the rig moving downstream towards me. So placement here is gonna be sort of somewhat important. Also, but right there, the current starts pulling in. What I'm gonna try to do is cast a little further up and this part of the current right there is actually pulling towards me. That was a little inside. That was not a bad cast, but it wasn't a good cast. Horrible cast, short, there we go. Be able to reach, better drift that time. Okay, we're gonna go further out. Right on the edge, that's the cast. It's right down that line. Now we're going in that soft water and then you overreact. <laughs> All right, short little strokes. Remember when you miss a fish, you gotta cast back up stream to give that fly time to settle. You don't cast the spot where you missed a fish because it takes still some time for that nymph 
or whatever rig you're using to settle back in. So just remember that. Don't cast to where you missed the fish. Cast above. Give it some time to drift to that fish. Pop. Not there. Short little stroke. Reach. Reach. Good drift that time. Hopefully these fish have a short-term memory. Drift. Drift. So what we do, that seemed like a pretty aggressive little fish. Just gonna take this SOS off, and we're gonna drop a worm underneath of it. Again, thinking on the short memory basis, maybe if we give them a big piece of eye candy here, this worm or junk fly, it might come back and completely forget that they got stuck a minute ago by an SOS. Doesn't always work. Sometimes it does. And when you're working this much water and your spots are limited, just kind of exhaust as many opportunities as you can before you move on. Same deal, we're just switching flies. That's all we're doing. We're going through a worm pattern. High stick in that indicator fly. Just drifting, drifting. That's a spot. Yep, where we missed a fish, and there we go. So right there, just taking your time and just working or exhausting the opportunities before moving up to the next spot. Patience does pay off. This is the native brook trout. This fish was here long before we were and probably will hopefully be here long after we're no longer here. Once your fly gets wet, we're going to need a desiccant, something to kind of wick the moisture off your fly. This is a dry fly desiccant, just a powder. This stuff is going to wreak havoc. If you look at my fingers up close, lots of cracks. This stuff will get in, into your fingers and just dry out your hands and then just develop these really hard, nasty cracks. So anytime you're applying a desiccant, try to use a pair of forceps, just trying to limit your exposure, hand exposure. The other thing too is this stuff is not good for you at all. And anytime you're using this, just make sure you're staying upwind. You never want to be inhale or breathe any of this stuff. This is just nasty stuff, but it works miracles on your dry flies. All streams, just remembering tactically, that's by far the best looking spot in my opinion right here. But before we do that, I do want to cast here in what you can call maybe a B or C water. Always worth just taking an extra second, get in position here, even though this is an uncomfortable casting position. But again, I'm forced right now to go on the right side. We're gonna keep that elbow in, just break the wrist. We're just gonna work the side cast. Establish the casting plan right here. Focus on your target, the line unwrapped. One cast, the line out. Not a very good cast, one back cast. Fire it in there, there we are. Reach, reach, reach. Any hook set's gonna be down low into the side. I had this limb right above me. Fire in there. Right below the boulder, again. Probably too, too, too many cast, but still a pretty good looking spot. Switch gears. Now we're gonna go to the very top here. Fire this in. Reach over those nagging currents. Such a great spot. Now, here's the thing too. I could be slow, which is very likely, but this worm I'm fishing is a pretty big worm. A lot of these fish are pretty small. Chances are a lot of these fish aren't even getting a fly in their mouth. So we're just gonna go back down to a smaller fly. You'll get these short strikes, sometimes you're late, but a lot of times in these smaller streams, the fish just isn't getting those big worms or those bigger flies in their mouth. So I'll just go down to a smaller nymph, the original SOS, tie this on. And then, bone arrow cast, flip, 
reach. This short stream casting, all this is is just a flip of the wrist. It's all we need. We don't need to look like we're throwing a javelin. Just a short little stroke. Basically all wrist with a little forearm. The other thing this does too is reduces our movement to the fish. These fish are not used to as much human interaction as the limestone streams. And because of that, we can't just kind of wave our hands up and down, and say, here we are. We gotta just reduce our movements. And then also using or wearing clothing, more drab, even some camo, to kind of help hide our appearance. There we are. Just patience, such a good looking spot. This is one of those spots in these small streams where I'm gonna make four or five casts. It's such a good looking spot though. Nice brook trout here. Yeah. So the one thing about line control here is in small streams where you have rocks, obstructions, just lots of things for flies to grab onto, this is where I'm gonna to prefer to use more of a hand and twist retrieve where I'm just using the back fingers here and the fingers to... So with line control here in these small streams, we have rocks, sticks, obstructions. Instead of just stripping and laying line on this water like you see here, if there's anything for that line to grab onto, it's definitely going to. So this is where we're gonna do more of a hand and twist retrieve. This is why I like the hand and twi twist retrieve for most of my presentations where I can cast the line. I just bundled the line hand right here in my hand. But that way line doesn't fall on the ground. I have control. Then when I wanna make a cast, I kick out some slack and make the cast. But just by having control and not allowing that line to fall on the ground, it's going to save you a lot of hassles on these small streams. Such a cool little thing. They're starting to see some fish rising and that soft edge. Tiny little guys, little, looks like little native brookies, maybe a little brown, but there's some, what appears to be some bluing olives on the far side and some smaller fish just kind of dancing. So I want to catch one on a dry fly here. This is. Why we do small stream fishing? Hopefully, this water temperature warming things up. It's going to allow us to get one or two fish on the dry. But again, I'm in position here. The reason why these fish start rising is because I've been here for about two minutes. I think they've gotten used to me. Hand here, short little cast. I'm going to make a reach cast right here. Position the lion leader upstream of the fly. And there we go. That was awesome. And even though these guys are just tiny little fish, I mean, this is. This is like gold in the mountains. It's absolute little marbles. Thank you. Let's see if we get one more here. Okay, casting across stream. If I just cast straight across, lion leader gonna land in the fast freeze currents and likely just drag my drive fly. So all we're gonna do is just cast, stop the rod tip, and just slide the hand smoothly upstream. Just stop and reach upstream position that lion leader upstream of the fly, giving us a, a longer, more natural drift. Reach, drag starting to set in right there. One more cast and reach, twit. Take a look at some of these rocks right here. These freestone streams, sometimes you'll see some larger insects, some larger mayflies. There's a couple insects crawling around here, but. When you compare the insect life of these freestone streams compared to limestone streams and spring creeks, it's got far fewer insects. And as a result, these fish can't be as choosy as they are on some of the other limestone spring creeks. So you don't need to make as many casts in these areas. Uh, you don't need to carry as many flies. In fact, most of the flies I fish today, the only flies I brought today, I have a little drive fly box here and then a few nymphs. 
but you can just basically fish everything you need basically in one box. So one of the things the Tenkara rod gives you is the advantage to quickly collapse and take the rod out whenever you want to use it. So whenever you're walking a stream like this, you have cold night, you got snow the night before, and t traditionally water like this, these little pockets, shallow little runs are often going to be sometimes really productive areas. With the water temperatures now, I haven't taken the water temp, but I can pretty much guarantee it's somewhere in probably in the high 30s. These fish kind of have locked jaw, and really the only spots I'm trying to in intentionally hit now are the slower moving, deeper sections of water like we see up here. So this just allows us to kind of just walk along distance and just kind of hit our spots. Well, this is like the Caesar Palace or like the Hilton hotel of this reach. This is just a magnificent hole. Deep. If we're going to catch a fish, this is where this would provide some of the best opportunities. Simple little bow and arrow cast here with our streamer. Just let that thing sink. Ciders on the bottom. There we go, good fish. Yeah, nice fish. Yeah. Woohoo! <laughs> oh my god. these longer rods small stream but lots of overhead room to make this cast we're gonna reach out this 11 foot rod just allows us to kind of pop light pop right in there and just jig it a little further out the other side hold the rod tip out and just kind of dig there we go yeah there we go good fish nice little brown yeehaw Old Creelix never disappoints. So one of the things we talked about in class is the Spring Creeks, Limestone streams that we fished near campus. A lot of those streams, the source of the water comes from under the ground. So the water temperature is regulated on some degree. So even when you have a a really cold snap the night before or even a little bit of snow melt water temperatures will change but they're not as affected by a major shift in air temperature or with major snow melt like we have in these small mountain streams and five degrees in either direction especially on the downward side on a cold spring day like we have today can just create lockjaw on a lot of your small mountain streams and as evident today we covered a lot of water a couple miles found probably 12 to 15 of the best spots along the way worked some flies and only got two fish so that's kind of the name of the game when you're fishing these small streams in variable weather like we had today i'm hoping in the last couple of weeks i was kind of able to show you a couple different situations we we're fishing high water showed you a couple nymphing approaches, one with a cider, what we call European nymphing. The other is fishing under an indicator or a suspension device. In that case, it was the New Zealand wool indicator and fishing a small mountain stream. And the thing I love about fly fishing is 
even though you feel like you can fish these bodies of water, streams like this that I frequent on a regular basis, streams that you think you have a good understanding of and that you can go back and use the same approach, that's not going to work because streams are dynamic in the situation, meaning that just like pe people, people have their good days and like streams, they often have their good days and there are days where no matter what you do, they're going, the fish are just going to be willing and eat your fly. And then they have some off days, and those are the days that kind of humble you. Days where you go in there thinking you're going to catch fish, and you can't even move a single fish. But that is what I love about this game and about fly fishing. It always keeps you thinking. And fly fishing is not difficult. It's not challenging. It just requires work. But also, more importantly, it just requires thought. And if you go in there into a stream situation with an open mind, and with an open mind that is being willing and able to adapt to the conditions that are being presented to you, you're going to be very successful as a fly fisher. And this not only applies with fly fishing, but also just in the game of life and with everything else. So I'm hoping in the last couple weeks during the semester, you have kind of learned the beauty and the joys of fly fishing and how this can apply to your everyday life as well. And more importantly, I'm hoping that this has inspired you to kind of take on fly fishing post-graduation because the rewards that fly fishing provides you is going to be something that you're going to be able to take and gleam the benefits of for the rest of your life. So I want to say thank you for taking the class and want to wish all of you the best in the future. Take care.